Who are you? Who are you? As individuals, we all have different answers. After giving your name to someone, how else do you identify yourself? Do you identify yourself by your profession, by the names of your parents or of your children or of your spouse? Or do you identify yourself by the interests you have, the place of your birth, the location of your home? Or do you identify yourself by political affiliation or by what you do in your spare time or by what is important to you? What do you want other people to know about you? And what do you want to know about other people? Who are you? Much of scripture has to do with life in the community of faith. First, life in the garden, and then life on the ark, and then life on the move. As the Israelites trudged through the wilderness for 40 years on their way to a land which seemed so far away, filled with milk and honey. The Old Testament witnesses to a community ruled by judges, and then by kings, preached to by prophets and more prophets and still more prophets. Jesus is born into a family, and as soon as he embarks upon his ministry, he creates his own community. The twelve are gathered, and they gather even more to themselves. And then, after Jesus... The Apostle Paul has traveling partners and friends in many towns. If there is anything to be gleaned from the whole witness of Scripture, it is that God created human beings to live together in community. And so the larger question, the much larger question than who are you, for the community of faith becomes the one raised by the sermon title, Who Are We? Who are we? Like the answer to the question, who, who are you? There are a variety of answers to the communal question before us. Here are a few that I think apply to all of us. We are human beings created in the image of God. We are beloved children of God. We are human beings claimed by God's grace. We are people who have responded to God's grace by saying, I trust in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. We are a family bound not by who we are as individuals, but by the one in whom we trust. We are a community of God's people called to show the love of Christ, and Jesus says earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world. At the most basic level, I believe, we are together because somehow in the mystery of God's love and providence, God has called us to be together and to belong to God and to each other. Today's scripture reading is the last we will hear for, from the Sermon on the Mount, at least in the near term. Today's is a continuation of Jesus' teaching to the disciples and then to the many others who also gather on that mountain 
hoping to hear a nugget of truth for their lives. In this part of the sermon, Jesus has a lot to say about who we, who his followers are to be. There is no question about it. Jesus paints a rather demanding picture of kingdom life. His sermon includes statements that most of us would prefer to regard as metaphorical or intended only for the first followers of Jesus, or at least not applicable to the time in which we live. But there are no weasel words here. There is no easy way out if we take the scripture seriously. And this teaching of Jesus finds its power in a particular community, a community like ours, a community, the disciples, who find their identity in the work of God. And so, with that said, let me remind you of some of the things Jesus makes plain in this part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says to his followers, if someone hits you, turn the other cheek. He says, don't seek revenge, leave that to God. He says, if someone sues you, give them more than they are asking for. He says, if someone wants you to do this thing, do that thing, and then another thing. He says, whenever you see a beggar, whenever you see some with, someone with need, give them something. Jesus says, lend without limits. Jesus says, love your enemy. Jesus says, pray for the people who persecute you, even those who are mean to you on the playground, that means. And Jesus says, greet strangers, not just friends, but strangers. I'll be honest, this seems hard. And perhaps too hard. It certainly doesn't draw us in to a warm and fuzzy relationship with Jesus, does it? And then, as if that is not enough, Jesus says, be perfect, be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. What? Be perfect? What could Jesus possibly mean by that? And what in the world does perfection look like anyway? It is helpful to know more about the Greek word which is translated as perfect. The Greek telos can indeed be translated as perfect, or alternatively as completion, or whole, or determined end. So this form of perfection is not about making all A's, it is not about hitting every free throw. It is not even about getting every relationship right. Perhaps a more accurate way to think about humans being perfect in the sight of a perfect God is to think about it like this. Persistence. Perfection may be persistence in the way of Christ. That is moving toward the goal of God's kingdom. The reformer Martin Luther was fond of saying, the Christian life is not about arriving, but about always becoming. The Christian life is not about arrival, but about always becoming. The gospel witnesses to the value of persistence. 
to keeping at it. Think about it like this. There are the disciples, experienced fishermen who fish all night. They fish all night and then return empty-handed to Jesus for help filling their nets. And the shepherd, the shepherd who had 99 sheep, was persistent in seeking the one that was lost. And the woman with nine coins was persistent in turning over her house and sweeping and cleaning as she searched for one lost coin. And the women, the women going to the tomb on the third day, even when all hope was lost, were persistent in finding the Christ. The Apostle Paul travels throughout Asia Minor for several tumultuous years, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with people who reject his message, with people who persecute him, and with people who will throw him in prison. Persistence, keeping on toward the goal of the kingdom. It is my great joy to visit regularly with members of this congregation who have been part of it for 50 or more up to 80 years. One thing that marks their understanding of what it means to be part of a single faith community for all those years is persistence. That is, staying with, moving forward with, holding on with, with the community, the people that God has called together. For them, persistence means caring for flawed pastors, if there has ever been one. And it means completing a pledge card every time one arrives in the mail. It means making a casserole for someone who's sick, even someone you may not know. That persistence means welcoming strangers who may venture sometimes even into your own pew. And it means praying for the sick and simply showing up week after week after week. Several years ago, in fact now five years ago, when we were preparing to recognize Blue Honeycutt and Tom Raby as 75-year members of the church, I asked them, how have you lasted so long in one church? They were not together when they answered my question, but their answers mirrored one another. I've always tried to do what my church asked of me. They have persisted in the goal Jesus has for them. Persistence in the kingdom of God in the community of faith takes many forms. It is searching the scripture for new understanding of who Christ is. And it is pouring a container of coins into the soup pot month after month to provide resources for hungry people. And it is setting up tables over and over and then taking them down. Persistence is about seeking truth with a family of faith. It is about welcoming the strangers who will surely show up if we invite. It is about singing the faith week after week, month after month, year after year. It is about offering forgiveness even to one who does not ask. It is about praying without ceasing. It is about helping to fill the grocery cart with bags of beans and bars of soap for SCCM. Persistence is about visiting the sick, about making friends of those who at first 
may appear to be the enemy. Persistence is about taking steps, however small they may be, toward mercy and justice. And it is about being willing to do what your church asks of you. Who are we? At our best, at our best, we are a people of God who live like we believe Jesus is at work in our midst, bringing about God's kingdom. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, as we follow the risen Christ, we will one day become those who are indeed perfect. We will be the people Christ calls us to be if we persist in turning the other cheek, foregoing revenge, giving more than is required in a lawsuit, going the extra mile, giving to those who beg, lending without limits, loving the enemy, praying for the people, the very people who persecute us, and greeting strangers. Because that is who we are. We are people who every day become more and more like Christ. It is not about arriving at perfection. It is about becoming more like Christ. We are a community called to wholeness and perfection by the power of the Holy Spirit. And our life together is a life that calls us to fully love one another and seek together to be the people Christ calls us to be. It is not about arriving. It is about becoming more fully and faithfully the people of God. Amen.